All right, let's go ahead and bring this back up here. And uh, I'm going to open this up in prayer, and then I'm going to ask you some of these questions. You guys will answer together as a big group. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and we thank you for this time that you've given to us. And each week, God, uh, it's been part of my prayer that uh, those who are here would not just get more information so that they sound smarter, uh, but God, we want to get more information so we can change. We want to get more of your word. We want to get more of your spirit as much as that's possible uh, so that we can be better husbands, more importantly, so that we can reflect you and become more Christ-like. So we ask that you would work in us tonight, God. I pray that uh, our conversations be honoring and glorifying to you. And uh, I just ask for your blessing over our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> so, what stood out to you the most from last week? <laughs> we'll start there. Bueller. Bueller. Yeah. I think just, just really deep diving into the topic of forgiveness, like, you know, as it, as it relates yeah. to, to our spouses and sort of not just, okay, yeah, sorry, you know, but really taking the time. Like, we were just talking at the table about just, you know, like, there's times where you ask for forgiveness because you need it, there's times where you don't ask for forgiveness because you're just not, you're not there yet. Yeah. But understanding that that place exists, you know. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and thinking through, I, I know with, with my own kids, right, there's a, a vast difference between when they are saying, will you forgive me from the heart, and doing what mom and dad have asked them to do. Uh, one, I think, brings about change. The other one guarantees the same action is going to happen again, uh, right? And so if one of them takes something from the other one and you hear that, right, and, and, we're, and, and I'm, I'm working through that with them, and one says... I am really sorry I took that from you. Will you forgive me? And the other one goes, yeah, I'm sorry for hitting you. Right? I mean, like, there's a big difference. I think one's going to exact a pound of flesh all over again the next time that happens. Uh, so I, I, I do think it's important to, to talk about how, what this really <coughs> looks like in real life. Because we don't want to sweep stuff under the rug and act like it didn't happen. Now, I will say this, well, kind of why I want to hang out here just a little bit longer is the other side of the ditch is that you use something like Luke 17, 3 to hang on to sin. Like, oh, you weren't repentant enough. And so therefore, I don't have to forgive you because God's word gives me that permission. Like, that's the other side of the ditch that we want to be careful of. So, yeah, okay. And anything else? Yeah. I would it. say um, it's easier for me to rebuke my kids than it is to rebuke my wife. Yeah. I found that out the, the hard way. Okay. It's a, it's a tough one. Yeah. So. Any thought to that? I mean, you, you don't have to oh. unpack. This would be a big counseling session right now, but uh, any thought to why that might? I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopping in that boat with you. It's very easy for me to do that. Yeah. And, and probably on the harsher side of things. Yeah. Well, I actually I prayed about it beforehand. It had to be done. But I think you, you put up an adjective before the rebuke, right? Loving or kind, yeah. compassionate rebuke. And so I, I spent a lot of time on that compassionate rebuke, but it still needed to happen. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to ignore it or you know, wipe it under the rug, but yeah. it had to happen, but uh, you know, I just I found it more effective to to have that discussion with my kids versus you know my wife yeah on these on some of these topics yeah yeah so it's just a challenge it is yeah and I think these the in these I like that word challenge these challenges cause us to rely more on the Lord um, in, in in going through because I know if, if I go in and Ben Marshall's strength and knowledge, I will, it's a bull in a china shop, yeah. um, and it is not fun. The, the plus sign from your advice last week and from reading the book is uh, to not make it, well, this is my opinion, but it's actually, this is the sin. Yeah. And 
sin, you can't rebuke the sin, right? The sin is there, but it needs to be brought up that, you know, this is the, the sinful behavior or activity that needs to be rebuked. Yeah. And, it, and it's less of my opinion, and it's more of my calling out what the problem is, what the big biblical problem is. Yeah. So. Absolutely good. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So this is kind of on and off topic, but I'm reading Gospel of Ephesians. Yeah. Okay. And you talk about the rebuke and the unwillingness, maybe that a person to really feel that remorse. And I think a lot of it has to do with having idols like pride or yeah. whatever else. And it makes it makes that communication that moment difficult. Yeah. And you may not even see that you're hanging on to that. So we, we kind of talked about both those things. We also asked the question of, you know, what do I do if I if I don't feel remorse when I know I should? Yeah. How do I deal with that? Yeah. Um, so. And, and, and that's a great question. And I think the answer is spend more time here yeah. and allow the Word of God to bring that conviction. Yeah. Um, right? So that that is... Sometimes there are books written about a certain thing or a, a, a message about it that, that can unpack that a little bit more, but this is the living and active Word of God, and this is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? So this is what I, I found most effective. Um, there are other things that highlight this that can be somewhat effective, you know, gospel treason and so on and things like that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, yeah. But that, that is, what, what happens if I'm not remorseful? Um, what happens if pride is, is blinding me there? And that's where if we go all the way back to that Y chart, right? sometimes things like that can be helpful too. Like, okay, if I choose to keep going this way, it feels good right now, it's easy at the beginning, I know it's going to get hard. Um, where if I go God's way, it is hard at the beginning. And it, it might be, so I'm just thinking like me and my wife, if I'm struggling um, to be remorseful, it might be that I just need to start the kind of the snowball rolling down the hill with my wife and, hey, we, I, I know we have to have a discussion. I'm not feeling that repentant, but I want to get there. Can we just start talking and hopefully roll? Um, God has used my wife in my life in that way. I'm like, she is, she never intends, I, I'm, my wife is the most soft-spoken, gentle woman I know, but she has had some zingers that I don't, like she doesn't intend for them to be zingers, but I'm like, oh, yeah, that hurt. And she didn't intend for it to be that way, but that was just kind of where things were. Okay, anything else? I remember uh, in, in repentance and remorse process, the old Dave Harvey book, uh, the faucets being open and allow. Oh yeah, when sinners say I do. When sinners say it, and allow kind of time for scripture to breathe and allow for them to, you know, in both both ways to come yeah. back and you know what, I, I do need to repent and I ask for forgiveness for, you know, even the initial approach to doing the hard thing. Yeah. Know, you're saying, it's, it's easy to tell your three-year-old to, you know, yeah. stop at a good and easy. Right? But yeah. But it's your wife, it's very gentle and approach. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Anything else? Because if, if nothing else, I hope it just messed with you. <laughs> That's what I would hope for. Just this, the, 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 it's, it's easy because it's a churchy word to say forgiveness, right? But to unpack that and say, what does this mean for me? What is this calling me to do? Here's the only other thing I want to encourage you with, um, is make sure you talk about the gospel often, whether you're repenting or whether you're granting forgiveness. Right, because I I have found just my size and my my tone of voice. So this is more with my kids than with my wife. But they could they, they can say and do the right thing out of fear. And I'm not trying to be to induce fear. I'm just a bigger guy. And I'm thinking, you know, I've got a, a two year old, little Finley, who right now she is in her terrible twos. And, and you know, I, I can say, Finley, stop it right now. And I can see her. She just stares at me, and like her eyes get all you know watery, and and then I'm mommy, mommy, you know, something like that. But bring the the gospel in on things, 
I mean, if if you, and, and so now I'm, I'm talking, I, I know this isn't a parenting class, but I'm going to use a parenting example, and then we can slide over into a spouse example. But with, with kids, if you know one of your kids is lying, if I know one of my kids is, is lying, I've had a couple of these where, I mean, I could say the sky is blue, and they go, no, it's not. It's green. Look at it. Yeah, I did. It's green. All right. And you, you know they're lying. To bring the gospel to bear, you know Jesus died for lying, right? There's nothing to hide from. Like the, Embrace that and just tell the truth. Because Jesus already covered it. There's absolutely nothing to hide from. There's everything to gain by telling the truth. There's everything to be lost by lying. And that you, can, you can coax them in the right direction by having them focus on the gospel. So that, that's the only, that's the, the balancing side of things I would throw out here. We can talk about forgiveness and repentance and have the gospel absent from that and be very secular in our approach. Um, I mean, you, I, I could say, this is what's best for your marriage. If you tell the truth and you change, okay? <laughs> it's kind of repentance and forgiveness there a little bit. But once we bring in the, the gospel, right now there's a peace. You're right. Jesus, he covered this. It's done. I don't need. I don't have to fear God, um, and we can work through this. So that would be the, the the balancing side of things. I don't think I ever got to that last week, um, and I, I thought, oh, that would be horrible if we left this topic without talking about the gospel. Um, one other thing that I would just want to. So there are a billion books on forgiveness. That, that deal with the, the topic. You can, John MacArthur, I think his is Forgiveness Full and Free. Uh, here's one called Pursuing Peace. Uh, here's one here called Forgiveness, The Power and the Puzzles. Um, you know, so there's, there's lots of books out there on forgiveness. Um, but this is just another way of thinking about that forgiving on two different, they, they have two different sides to this one, or there, there are two different sides to this one thing called forgiveness. And so um, Robert Jones who wrote Pursuing Peace, he talks about it this way. He said, there's transacted, granted, relational forgiveness. That's level two. That's the that's on this side. But we would have, on that sheet there, is it called relational forgiveness there? What's, what's the second one? There's judicial forgiveness, but then there's fellowship forgiveness. I, I knew it was a different word. So there's, But he says here, on that side, there's relational forgiveness. So whether it's fellowship forgiveness, or relational, and then the other side is an attitudinal heart or dispositional forgiveness. And, and so, um, this is how he, he, he breaks it out with, with two different columns. He says, on the attitudinal, the heart, the dispositional side of forgiveness, that is mandatory. We have to do it. Mark eleven twenty five clearly states, if you are worshiping and you realize you have something against somebody, stop what you're doing and go and make that right. That's not optional. You have to do that. Which think think about a Sunday morning. I don't know if you face this on Sunday mornings, but sometimes that can be the worst on the way to church. Um, that's where it happens. And then you walk in the door and smiles on your face, and you sing, and you might raise your hands if you're a hand raiser. Uh, I don't know, right? Um, so, but this would say before you get out of your car, make it right. Don't go in and worship God with all of this turmoil going. All right, so um, there's this vertical focus between me and God, right? I need to release bitterness from my heart. That's that internal stuff. Um, it's unconditional. It's independent of the offender's repentance. So it's not connected to them repenting at all, right? And then there's the, so there's some commitments to God. He says, here's, here's the first commitment. To release the offender from my judgment and entrust him to God or her, since we're talking about our wives, right? Number two, to empty my heart of bitterness. Now, that, that, is, that takes some unpacking once again. Because um, we, we have a lot of churchy terms. Give it to God. What does that mean? How do you do that? Empty my heart of bitterness. What does that mean? Uh, you can't just... Right? It doesn't do that. Um, so what does that mean? And then be ready. This is what I love. Be ready to grant level two forgiveness and reconcile the relationship if the offender repents. So it's that reconciliation of the relationship. But then there's this second level, and that's that fellowship side. Um, and this is, so Jesus commanded in Luke 17, 3 and 4, we talked about that last week, right? Um, it's a horizontal focus. So it's between me 
and for our purposes, my wife, right? It's to reconcile the relationship with the offender. It's relational. And it's conditional. It's dependent on the offender's repentance. Right? And then here, so here's the, the commitments to the repentant offender. Um, I will not raise the forgiven offense to myself. I won't dwell on it or brood about it. I won't bring it up to others. I won't gossip. And I won't bring it up to you or use it against you later. So there's just another way to think about how to break that out um, that can be helpful. But, but what, once again, you want to bring the gospel to bear over and over and over again. That can just soften hearts where they're hard. Um, hey, we don't have to fight about this. Let's remember the gospel for just a second. Life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Right? Okay. Any other questions or comments from your tables? No? Yeah. So, someone does not repent. Yeah. I forgive them anyways. And we're talking about this. In a way, like, not, I forgive you because you sinned against me, but, and you didn't repent. Like, not like lord it over them, but I, between me and God, I'm going to forgive them so I can forgive them. You, are we supposed to forgive even when repentance doesn't happen for ourselves, for our freedom? So, and, and th is this is where the the worldly focus on forgiveness, because the world would ab would absolutely say you have to forgive, um, but it's it's for selfish reasons. They they would say this is for your own good. Forgive, right? And so. From a worldly perspective, it doesn't matter if the person is alive, if they're around, if you even have a relationship with them anymore. They would say, this is for your own good. Forgive them. Now, once again, you have to unpack that. What does that mean to forgive? Does that act like it didn't happen? Or all, all, all that kind of stuff. So um, biblical forgiveness is, has it's a completely selfless focus. Meaning, I'm doing this. Jim, you're right in the front again. I'm going to use you again. Um, if, if, I, if, if Jim sins against me, right, the, the, I have to be selfless in my approach to him. Um, and and I, I have to love him enough to bring his sin to his attention. Um, now, he might say, go take a hike, Ben. I don't care. I, I know Jim well enough, he's not going to do that. But he, he, he could say that. And I, I think what, what I love about uh, Luke 17.3 is Jesus is just making a statement there. You can't reconcile with somebody unless repentance and forgiveness happen. You just can't do it. Now, you, you can pretend, um, but it, it's not true biblical Gospel-driven repentance, uh, uh, reconciliation. D does that make sense when I, is that helpful sort a little of, bit? Okay. And probably in a selfish way for me. Like okay. To say I want to forgive so I can be free of this yeah. crappy feeling. So yeah. I'm going to forgive you 100%. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to throw it in your face. I'm not, you know, not going to talk about it. Yeah. Because yeah. it hurts. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, I, I, so two sides of the ditch again. One side of the ditch would, would be, I'm going to lord this over you and just make you pay every day of your life. right? So that's one side of the ditch over here. The other side of the ditch over here is I'm going to act like this, this doesn't impact me at all. It's they, Let bygones be bygones. And there are some times, I mean, Pro Proverbs is clear in a couple points. Love covers a multitude of sins. I think love should cover a multitude of sins. Um, but there are some sins, and I think that it's, it's individual. Um, my wife could say something to me that totally wouldn't offend me, and it would offend you. <laughs> and your wife could say something to you that wouldn't offend you, and it would totally offend me. right? So it's, it, this is a very individual thing where I think about it all the time. Um, or maybe whenever certain names happen or certain places I, and I'm just like, oh, I, I, my, this is where my mind is. I'm thinking about this. I, I think that's where we have to, out of love for that person, go to them and say, 
misses the sin. I'm not going to snub you. If I see you on the, on the sidewalk, I'm going to say hi. Um, but I, I can't treat our relationship like it's okay. I, and we, we, we do see glimpses of that, if, if not in full picture, like in, in full color with the church discipline process. I mean, here at, church, at King Hills, we do church discipline, right? And, and so we love people too much to leave them in their sin. And so, unfortunately for Jim, uh, if, if, if Jim sins against me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to Jim. And if he says, forget you, Ben, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyways, right? I'm, I'm going to bring some of you with me to him, and we're, we're going to confront him. We're, we're not going to act like it didn't happen, and we're not going to, I mean, we're, we're going to do the, the exact opposite of the three promises there. We are going to bring it up to him. And when, when I see him, I'm going to be reminded, oh, there's this, this thing between Jim and I. we got to get this fixed, right? And, and so, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't respond with two or three of us coming, we're going to tell it to the church. And if he doesn't respond to that, then we're going to ask him not to come back here. Now, that seems to be a picture here. We're not exacting punishment on him. We're not saying shame, 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 uh, boo on you, right? That's not it. We're, but we're, what, what we are saying is, is our relationship is severed. And we've tried here, and we've tried here, and we've tried here, and we've tried here to get you to repent so that our relationship can be restored. And that's not working. So there's, there's another example of, of that forgiveness. You know, we're, we're not, not exacting justice here. Uh, we're not penalizing somebody. Um, and then on the, the backside of that, should Jim repent, there should be the biggest celebration ever that a broken relationship has been restored because that's the power of the gospel. Is that helpful in just unpacking that a little bit more? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's not cut and dry. It's not crystal clear. And when I'm personally involved in this, I, I can I can iron out lots of wrinkles from up here. <laughs> but when I'm personally involved, I need other people helping hold me accountable. Uh, otherwise, if I'm sitting in the seat of having to grant forgiveness, I I could hang on to something for a long time. I I know where I'm bent to go. And I have a filing cabinet in my head uh, that, that can lock onto things. So here, here's an example. Um, and so um, a couple of you know my former church where I was at. And so I want to be as respectful as I possibly can. Um, but there was, there was a situation in which I, I absolutely felt the senior pastor sinned against me. Um, and... and and, and it wasn't the first time I had seen him do that. I had seen him do that with other people. And so in his office, I, I said, and, and I, I start off with, with all due respect, please hear me. I, I'm, I'm lovingly saying this. You have a reputation of tearing other people down to lift yourself up. Now, that was a harsh statement. It was a true statement. And I tried to say that in as much love as I possibly could. But if I would have said it any other way, hey, I think you say some mean things sometimes. Who doesn't say some mean things sometimes? Notice that's not a sinful thing to say some mean things sometimes. I say some things in my office that other people deem as mean because I have to confront them. Well, that was a mean thing to say. If, if how I said it was mean... Come at me. I, I, I got to change that. But if what I said, not how I said it, but what I said. Now, you, you see that, that, that difference there? Um, now, I, I, if, if you know me, my number, well, let me ask, some of you do know this about me. What's my number one sin that I struggle with? Go ahead, say it. Uh, broken razor. <laughs> yes yeah no that's intentional <laughs> fear of man fear man right i that is my number one thing that i struggle with i absolutely if, if, if i'm not careful and if that thing's not killed on a routine basis i want people to approve me and i fear people rejecting me 
Now, think about that scenario going into my senior pastor's office and sharing that with him. No way would I ever want to do that. Like, that's it. My heart was like, yes, I get to stick it to him. I was sick at my stomach. I just remember going, I don't want to do this. Um, right, so out of love is why I went to him. Um, not out of, out of being mean or wrong, uh, you know, or any of that kind of stuff. So I don't want to belabor the point of that. that I just kind of want to help it make sense a little bit. Okay. Well, let's keep moving on here because we didn't get, we got about a third of the way through last week. We'll, we'll catch up, I promise. Um, so, uh, so, but why does repentance matter? And did I get to this diagram last week where the two walls were up? Okay, so we can kind of fly through this. Well, why does repentance matter? There's Luke 17, 3, right? And here's these two sides of things. I feel like I'm right in the middle of the TV. Um, so here's these two sides of things where one person has sinned on one side, one person has been sinned against, or they're innocent on the other side. And what, what we're looking for, this is that relational stuff in the middle. Right? So now think about your wife, or think about your kids, uh, or other relationships where you just want that good relationship in the middle, where I can see you at church and things are great. Um, things are, uh, like, you trust me when I say, you look good today, you trust me. Uh, when I say there's money in the bank account, you trust me. <laughs> when, uh, when I ask you, is there gas in the car, I, uh, I trust you. <laughs> That's been an issue lately. Okay, anyway, um, so, so there's, there's those things that, that are in the middle. And what Luke 17, 3 states is you can't get there until those walls come down. Right? Now you, you can try, and you can try and shout through the walls. You can climb up on top of the wall and talk down. That never works, FYI. Talking down to somebody never works, never received well. Um, right? And so one person can repent, and the other person, I should have put those things down there, but, but one, one person can repent, and the other person not forgive, and there still is an issue. Right? One person can, now, oh, that's what we're shooting for. This went out of order. Anyway. Um, this is what we're shooting for, is to have both of those walls come down. There we go. Uh, so that there's trust in the middle. One more story. This is a, this is a good story. This is a fun story. Um, so uh, Pastor Steve once, um, this isn't about Pastor Steve, but he was speaking, and um, I was on my way over to Leavenworth with my wife and my kids, and I get this call, and he says, Ben, I'm preaching on anger this Sunday, and I would love to give everybody, uh, have I said, have I told you? Okay, good, good. Uh, I forget which story I tell. I don't want to be one of those senile guys where everybody's like, have heard that story before? <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'm driving over. He says, I'm preaching on anger. I would love to give something practical to the congregation. Do you think you could teach an anger class? And he's preaching on Sunday. And, of course, Yep, I can make that happen. So uh, we create this anger class. And I don't know about if, you, if that excites any of you, uh, but teaching on anger to people who openly admit they struggle with anger, not on the top of my list. Right? Um, so I'm working through this, and we have a, a, a male class, and we have a female class, and, and my, my female instructor, she comes up to me and she says, so there's somebody who I don't think is very happy with. Um, and sure enough, an email came through later on that proved she was not happy with her. And so I said, well, I, I'm the pastor. Let me respond. So I responded. And she did not take that very well. Uh, and so there was this. Now, now think about for, forgiveness here. Right? There is I. She is not happy with me. Uh, I know that there's a broken relationship. When I see her at church, right, I'm, I'm walking this way and she's there. And she... <laughs> noticeably like there's nothing in front of you there's a wall but she's walking that way right and, and, and so then pastor steve a few months later after we're all done there's still this rift between us i tried to make eye contact nothing so then he gives a sermon on forgiveness okay and she finds me after that sermon and she goes pastor ben i just want to let you know i forgive you <laughs> now let me ask you what would you say? For what? 
Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't have to think too long about that. You didn't have to think too long about that. But that's what I said. Now, I didn't say for what. I, I said for what. I did the exact same. I didn't say for what. I said for what. No. Um, and she said, because you sinned against me. And I said, I so want to hear what did I do. And so she told me. And, I, and so I came back and I, I said, you know what? That's not sin. I know you didn't care for that, but that's not sin. So you don't need to forgive me. <laughs> and you could, I mean, it was crazy. I'm here, she's here, and this bubble starts forming. Mm -hmm. People are just walking further and further out. I don't know why to this day, but she was so mad at me. Um, and so there was quite a bit of height difference there, and she was just giving me the what for, just coming at me, coming at me. And my, I told you, fear of man is where I struggle. I so wanted to say not for what. I so wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you for forgiving me. Because that would have just, yep. right? And that, lots of people could have thought that was the gentle thing. Oh, Ben, that was good. I know you didn't sin, but that was good. Right now, our relation so our, our relationship is broken at that point. I mean, very, very broken. Um, and it was it was two or three years ago, and I, I tried to repair it. Wouldn't wouldn't return emails. Wouldn't return phone calls. Tried to repair it. Few few years ago, I'm at the biblical counseling conference that we have here, and you guys know that I I'm in charge of that thing. It's my neck in the news, and and I'm sitting at a table, and I see her come out of one of the like holy cow, what's she doing? And she comes over to me, and I'm like, oh, you <laughs> gave a message about forgiveness or something like that. And she came up to me, and she goes, Pastor Ben, do you remember that Sunday from a few years ago? And I'm like, what? you are the only person who could say that Sunday from a few years ago. I know exactly what you're talking about. I said, like, yeah, I, I, I remember that. She goes, that was a bad day. I said, yeah, that was good. She goes, will you forgive me? And when we see each other now, I mean, it's like best, I wouldn't say best friends. I mean, I high-five my best friends, and, you know, we don't high-five. But <laughs> when we see each other, it's a restored relationship, right? That would not have happened if I would have just said thank you. Um, which, by, by the way, some of my pastoral buddies said, Ben, why didn't you just say thank you? <laughs> like, why are you always looking for trouble? Um, I'm not, but... It, that's, that, to me, is a, is a good picture of what happens when there's repentance and there's forgiveness. So, now, I've got lots of examples of how I've screwed this all up all the time. I mean, not, not all the time, but I'm not. I just wanted to give you two examples of how that can work its way out. All right, let's fly through this. We talked about repentance. We talked about forgiveness. But once again, so what? Why does any of this matter? <laughs> um, I think there's some good things. That's why we stopped there. That's why we, we unpacked all of that. But so what? Um, why does any of this matter? So here's this next graph. And I think I did this graph earlier, but I just wanted to throw it up here again. This is my uh, progressive sanctification graph. All right? There, uh, this, this graph, there's time goes this way, holiness goes this way, right? Um, so... Well, let's just put it all up here. Here's the, the, the beginning spot, J. Anybody know what the J stands for? Justification. Okay, good. Justification. Now, that's a big old churchy word. What does that mean? Christ covered it. Christ covered it. Okay, good. You're justified. You're right with God. Okay, you're right with God. Right? It's a right standing with God. It is a declaration. Not guilty. Right? And there's nothing you can do to unjustify yourself. But you have to be justified in order to hop into this diagram. So if we go all the way back, remember the baseball illustration, right? You have to be on the team for this to be true. Um, you, you cannot not be on the team and be on this, this graph here. But justification, when you place your faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you are declared not guilty. That's justification, right? And then at the top, is the, the letter G. Anybody know what that stands for? Glorification. Glorification. All right, and what does that mean? You've reached God. You're now in His presence. 
Okay? Yeah, you, you're now in his presence, which means you're in glory or heaven. Yeah, I was going to say the H word, but no, yeah, heaven. Yeah, um, right? And so that happens one of two ways. Jesus returns or we die, right? Um, but this process of, of getting there looks something like this, right? It's not a straight shot. There's ups and there's downs. There's peaks and there's valleys. Um, now remember, this is all under the banner of so what? So what? What does repentance matter? What does forgiveness matter? Our holiness is why this matters. Right? And what I love about this is here, I'm a lot more holy than I was here. But the cool thing is, is even in a valley down here, I'm a lot more holy than I was at a peak here. And that's the idea of progressive sanctification. We are continually growing in our walk with the Lord. And in this repentance and forgiveness aspect of, or this, this idea that, that we've talked about, God uses that all the time to grow, to grow us. All right, I've given you a couple examples of positive Ben Marshall. Here's one that I absolutely hate. This, in my opinion, is worse than the sophomore telling his mom off. So this happened um, as a pastor at Canyon Hills. So I've been here for 10 years. I would say this is probably eight to eight and a half years ago. So I'm the counseling pastor at Canyon Hills. This isn't like 20 years ago, brand new husband. No, no, no. I've been married for about 10 years. So my wife and I um, had to, we had to sell our house in Port Orchard, which meant I was going over there every weekend. If you know where Port Orchard is, it's not too far away, but it's far enough. I was painting fences, getting a house ready, and at that time, the housing market had just tanked. So um, I was looking for one buyer. Not many buyers, just one, right? And so my wife and I, we had to install some smoke detectors, um, and we pull up next to our house, right by the white fence, and so she has these smoke detectors, um, and you know how they put those things in plastic, the, like the rivets around the edge, right? And so didn't have a knife, um, and, and, and I wasn't even thinking how we going to open this, but my wife decided to start going ahead and giving it a shot. And so, you know, if you weaken the plastic, you can eventually rip it. But there's that whole, <laughs> okay, that was going on. Um, and so here, out of my mouth, counseling pastor, Canyon Hills, right? I asked a question. I mean, you, uh, yeah, how would your wife respond to this? Um, I just said, do you ever feel like you're retarded? <laughs> that was what I said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and why are you up here, Ben? Uh, I am not. Uh, there was so many things wrong with that statement. It was at, it was aimed at my wife, but just the words in that statement were horrible. Um, and she came back with, "Do you feel like I'm retarded?" Great question, like meant to zing me. And I, you would have thought I would have learned, but I didn't. And I thought this was any better. It's just kind of like a monkey putting together a puzzle. That's what I said. Like, that was any better. I've never said that again. I repented of that, and she graciously forgave me. The growth process. I, this isn't the valley. It needs to go down there uh, in, in that moment. And why my wife responded as graciously as she did is beyond me. She had every right to both barrels... Uh, how is that Christ-like in any way? And just give it to me. Um, and she, she didn't. Um, so there, there you go. I gave you a couple positives and then one negative and just blew anything out of the water that was, that, that was positive. But in, in the for what, why, why does repentance matter? Why does forgiveness matter? Because Christ-likeness matters. All the way back week one, I said that was one of our goals. Our goals is, one of our goals isn't to just change. It's not to be a better husband. It's to be more like Christ. And so that's why all of this matters. We want to be like Christ. Um, we, we want to be like Christ in how we learn. We want to be like Christ in how we love. And we're, we're being like Christ in how we lead. That There's our, our three L's that, that we're working through. All right? Any questions about this diagram? Nothing huge about it, but sometimes this can be a, a, a breath of fresh air. Um, yes, 
I, I think a good gospel story always has failure in it, always has successes in it. Um, and the reason why we can be open and honest about that and just take a breath of fresh air is because it's been covered by Jesus on the cross. Right? And he's, I, I heard a, a, a guy talk about this like a man walking upstairs with a yo-yo. We're the yo-yo. Uh, and our job is to make the difference between the top of the hand and the bottom of the string shorter and shorter and shorter. But Jesus is the man walking up the stairs with us in his hand. We're going in that direction. Um, and that, that, makes, that, like, that makes discipline way different. Um, discipline is a loving thing. That's what Hebrews, 11, or, uh, Hebrews 12 says. God disciplines those whom he loves. Right? But if, if it's training, if he's helping me shorten that distance, that's a good thing. He didn't just let me dangle down all the way at the bottom. Okay? All right, um, well, as, as we're talking about leading, um, I, this is going to be where we, we make a sharp right turn. There's no easy transition here. Uh, we're just making a, a, a sharp right turn. Oh, progressive sanctification. Um, and, and here's what we're going to be talking about. As you lead your wife, right, there are moments, and this falls underneath the chapter, honey, you need to take a bath. Uh, has anybody gotten to that chapter yet in the, the book? Yeah, and it's all about how do you confront sin in your wife when you see it, when, when you see that. And if I'm sitting in your shoes, and I am in your shoes, like, mm, this isn't, I don't want to talk about this chapter. <laughs> um, right, but this is out of love once again. But here's where we, we, we have to go. Uh, we have to start with the conscience. Uh, anybody have a good definition of what the conscience is? Okay, so I would say that's the Holy Spirit trying to lead you with what's right and wrong. Um, but the conscience, because everybody has a conscience, right? It's not the cricket. Uh, yeah? The me that knows what's right and wrong. Okay, so... Doing what is wrong. That, so in, in that instance, I would say the conscience is functioning there, um, yeah. making you feel something... Letting you know this is wrong. <laughs> you should not be doing this. Moral Absolutely. Code. Okay. The moral code. Okay. So it, it works. It works in, um, in, uh, in cooperation with the moral code. Are you talking about like the Ten Commandments or your moral moral conviction of right and wrong? Okay. Yeah. Now what's and, and I, I, absolutely now what's the problem? With the conscience, darkened, subjective. Okay, it can be subjective. It's darkened. <clears throat> you can justify against it or for it. Okay, yeah. So it here's one word that I want you to think about in regards to the conscience. It's your guard, right? Think of a guy standing at a gate. It's your guard. Now the guard can be messed up, <laughs> right? And that's where um, it. It tells you what's right, and it tells you what's wrong, but it's working off of a standard. It could be way off, though. That standard can be way, way off. But that's the, the job of the conscience, is to say, standing at the gate, what can come in and what has to stay out. Right? And so the, the, the Bible talks about the conscience. What's something we can do, according to the Bible, to our conscience? Sin against it. Okay, we can sin against it, and other translations say sear it, all right? So we, we can, um, if we say, uh, I'm just going to use pornography as an example, because according to all statistics, we're in that boat, right? So we use pornography as an example. If we let pornography in over and over and over and over and over again, the guard gets seared to that, where now he's no longer bothered by anything. Yeah, yeah, it's just like a callus. And so here, he, he, here he is, and you know, pornography's coming this way. Oh, go on in, go on in, go on in. And so we don't get bothered by that anymore. So the conscience can be seared um, because the the standard has been changed. You're tracking with me on that one. So the Holy Spirit, though, is completely different than the conscience. So the conscience is the guard. I would say the Holy Spirit is the guide. 
Right? He's always going to work in accordance with this, which is why we hold this up high. The Holy Spirit is never going to do anything in opposition to Scripture. Track with me? So everybody has a conscience, which is a good thing. Um, that's a really good thing. They might not enjoy the fact they have a conscience, but everybody has a conscience. Not everybody has the Holy Spirit. Right? And so now we're talking about wives and their conscience. Because this is all under the category of leading. We are leading our wives, which means we have to lead ourselves first. But let's talk about four different consciences, four different categories of consciences. I don't think I printed this off for you last week. Did I print this off? No? Okay. Sorry about that. I, that's it. Yes, I did print that off. Woohoo! Yeah, it's blue and red, and then things in the like colors in the middle. They're a blending of the colors. Okay, so first kind of conscience that we need to talk about is a biblical conscience. All right, and then the next kind of conscience that we just mentioned is a seared conscience. There's two more though. And, and, and now, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but just keep in mind why we're talking about this. As you are thinking about confronting your wife and interacting with your wife, you have to factor in her conscience. What does her guard look like? What are some of her experiences in life that she's gone through that have informed the guard? Right? Um, one example in this for me. Uh, we have a little dog named Harley. Um, I am not a little dog fan. Uh, he's a punting dog. My lab is my hunting dog. This one's a punting dog. Um, and, and, and this was in our, our, our phase where my wife wanted a little dog. And, and anyways, I ain't going all that. Um, I know I can drive the dog crazy if I take my belt off. And not beat it, but take my belt off. And then I fold it in half and I go, whoosh, right? And make that snapping noise. Drives him bonkers. He just, he's running all over. Now, I can... I can do that, and I can have a lot of fun with that. Uh, but my wife, growing up, that sound meant something very different for her. Very different. Um, and uh, so I could continue to make that noise and say, I'm not sinning. Prove to me I'm sinning. Right? But for her, that is, uh, her guard has said, don't ever do that ever. Don't marry a man who does that. Don't be around men who do that. Right? And so as I'm trying to lead her, I don't want to lead her in the wrong direction because her conscience is saying, don't do this. I want to lead her in, in, in a loving way. All right, third one, third, third category is an untrained conscience. Now, I, and we'll unpack these just a little bit more. Um, and the, the fourth one is a weak conscience. So here's four different types of... And as I'm talking about this, I realize you might go, yikes, I don't have a biblical conscience. I've got one of these other three. So let's, let's talk about these here. Let's talk about a biblical conscience and, and what that is. All right? That is a conscience that's activated by the Bible, and shame is produced. And that's good when shame is produced. But it's activated by the Bible. That's the key thing there. That it's activated by the Bible. So, um, if I'm walking along, and uh, uh, since I use pornography, I'll use this again, and I see some pornography laying in the ditch, just let's pick a magazine, I know that's not very, that's not the biggest route for pornography anymore, but let's say it's in the ditch over here, and, you know, and a, a biblical conscience would lead me to do what? Throw it away. Throw it away. Okay? What else? Oh, that's it, Ben. Throw it away. <laughs> Acknowledge that it's wrong. Okay. Yeah. Acknowledge that it's wrong. Maybe even just pass it on by. Right? Now, if you're thinking, uh, well, but what if somebody else sees it? That would be why you would throw it away. Right? So you would want to protect other people. Yada, yada, yada. So there's a, a, a conscience that's activated by the Bible. Now, the seared conscience, on the other hand, right, it is not activated by the Bible, and shame is missing. Okay. Now, that, don't don't con, uh, don't confuse that with when they're caught, they feel ashamed. That's different than um, shame missing. You, you, you see that the difference there. Um, so, if if somebody gets caught doing something and they're ashamed, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have shame. Uh, am I 
I saying that right? So, if I catch somebody, we're, we're sticking with the pornography theme here. If, 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 if I catch somebody looking at pornography and they're ashamed, that doesn't mean they have a biblical conscience. That's what I'm trying to say. That means they got caught. Right? And if you want an example of that, look at King Saul. Uh, when he gets caught for not killing the Amalekites, specifically Agag and some of the camels and things like that. Okay? So there's a seared conscience. It's not activated by the Bible. Shame is missing. And so notice what's needed. Conviction is needed. Right? So that's where your rebuke needs to be factored in. How am I going to rebuke on this one? All right, but an untrained conscience. And notice the word new is up there. Right? So this is a conscience. It's never been activated by the Bible. So I, I, I don't know who's married to who in here. You might have a brand new believing wife. Right? And maybe you're a little bit further along in your walk with the Lord. So training is needed, but how do you, what, what kind of training for a brand new believing wife, for, for a conscience? How, what, what, how, how would that training, like give me some adjectives for what kind of training? Gentle. Gentle. Some patient. gentle, some yeah. patient training. Like a child. Yeah, study. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, my, my son who I threw up there, he was struggling with some math the other day. And, and, and as I was sitting down with him, I found myself like in my head, well, why aren't you getting this? This is simple. Um, right? But it's brand new for him. And, and, and that allowed me to oh, calm down <laughs> and, and to take a look at it from another angle. Okay. I mean, I, I, I went from pad and paper to puzzle pieces to try and show them how things are done, just a, a few other things. You just you patiently endure and you keep going and keep explaining things. So, never been activated by the Bible, but shame is missing. Right? This, this is a big piece because if, if they're brand new and they have an untrained conscience, but you look at shame is missing, you're like, oh, you've got a seared conscience. <laughs> and, and you go after them with conviction and a, a harsh rebuke right you can actually really damage a brand new believer right um remember at, at another church that i was at there was a woman who she had just become a believer uh, and wore some pretty provocative clothing right and in the the temptation for leadership was to say hey knock it off you're causing guys around here to stumble but once they they factored in she's a brand new believer she needs a, a, a godly woman to lovingly come alongside her and say, hey, let me, let me bring some scripture to bear here, right, in, in a loving and gentle way. So, untrained conscience. Then the last conscience, and this is the one I want you to be very, very careful of. It's a weak conscience, right? It's activated, so it's not a dead or a, 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 a sleep guard, right, and a guard who's fallen asleep. It's activated, and there is shame, but it's activated by the wrong criteria. Does that make sense when I say that? So instead of being activated by the Bible, it's activated by something or someone else. For instance, I hope you're not tired of the four instances here. Um, for instance, when my mom and dad got married, I would call my dad a Christian hippie. Um, we grew up, we had a Volkswagen van again our whole life. That was it. Christian hippie. Um, and my dad was, he was okay with most things. My mom came out of the Pilgrim Holiness movement. So she could not wear anything but a skirt. No makeup, no jewelry, um, all that kind of stuff. And she marries my dad, right? On the other side of I do, like five minutes after I do, do you think she felt the freedom to now wear pants or to wear jewelry or to wear makeup? No. Do you think she might have felt guilty or ashamed if she did that? What was the criteria that her conscience was working off of? Somebody else's. Somebody else's. Mom, dad, church, whatever. Right? And so now... There's retraining that's needed, but what kind of retraining? Give me some adjectives for this retraining. Loving, Loving gentle, absolutely, right? Um, and this is where, like, Romans chapter 14 comes into play. And in, in, in that particular chapter, Paul's talking about meat that's offered to idols. 
and the, the cultural practice for Christians back then, the uh, gods, they, they, they would sacrifice animals to gods, and then they would turn around and sell the meat for really cheap. Right? Some Christians say, hey, let's go get some cheap steaks. Have a good dinner. Other Christians are like, are you kidding me? That was offered to Zeus. No way can we do that. That would be blasphemous. And what Paul comes in and he says, hey, 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 stop judging each other. You who don't want to buy those steaks, don't do it. But don't judge your brother who does go do that. right? And you who are okay with it, don't invite your brother over who struggles with that and, and sucker him by serving him a steak and then go, oh, hey, by the way, that's where I got that from. right? Don't, don't do that. And, and it's, it's this conscience thing. And he says, don't do something that your conscience is against. To do that is a sin. So as you're working and leading, working with and leading your wife, you have to keep this kind of stuff in mind, right? And ask her, hey, how are you feeling about this? How are, we're making some changes. How are you feeling about that? And if she says, I don't, I don't think I'm okay with this, right? Don't just say, well, the Bible says we can do it. Here we go. Right? Don't do that. Ask her, so what's going on? Let, let's talk about this. And try and find that, that standard that she's living by. Right? So that you can gently lead her and move her from a weak conscience, which, by the way, don't say that. Well, you got a weak conscience. Don't, that's not okay. Um, right? But you can say, oh, that might be that thing that, 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 that Ben was talking about. And here it is. Some retraining is needed. Now, it's not retraining with Ben Marshall's training manual, right? It's retraining with Scripture here at the beginning. So as you lead, there's a high call for you to know Scripture a lot better. Questions about the conscience. Helpful. Right? And you can easily take this and apply it to yourself, by the way. Right? If you're struggling with a sin and you find yourself doing it over and over, what kind of conscience do you think you have? Probably have a seared conscience, right? That, that could be, well, it could be seared or it could just be an untrained conscience. If you're a brand new believer, that, that could be it, right? Um, you know, you're talking with your buddies and you're just like, and you drop an F-bomb or something, you're not even, that going to bother you. Everybody's like, no, you, you were in church. You didn't do up in a It might be a brand new believer, right? Um, so, but then there, there, there could also be some stuff over here. And weak conscience isn't always just, uh, well, that's weak conscience. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, um, let's take a break. Uh, we've been talking and talking and talking. Uh, five minute break, and then we'll we'll keep moving on. <clears throat> Thank you. 